are all driven by the same goal, and that is to ensure that we're securing a long-term future for the families and the communities that we represent. And that is the spirit of what brings us to public service. And it's why we're committed to the future of this province. And it's why we've got to make some tough choices sometimes and ensure that we're committed to our province's strong fiscal future. Now, we've had an opportunity today to talk a little bit about the budget, and uh, I just want to take a moment and thank Doug Horner for being an incredible Minister of Finance and leading us through some really good, tough work in the last two or three months. And I want to thank my Cabinet and my caucus colleagues who came back to work very early in January, and I will tell you that we did an awful lot of soul-searching in terms of some of the tough choices that we realized that we were going to have to make as soon as we became aware of the fact that we were being challenged with more difficult fiscal circumstances than we had anticipated 12 months ago. So I won't go into a great detail with respect to those, but I did want to say that we still, when we made the decisions in this budget, knew that we were dealing with a $6 billion revenue shortfall. Because we only have access to one single foreign market, essentially, the United States, which forces us to sell our existing products at a pretty steep discount. And we did have to make some difficult decisions, and we've talked about some of those here today. And I want to say quite honestly and very sincerely, I've certainly heard some suggestions that rural Alberta is bearing the largest burden of those decisions. And I really must say that I want to put those concerns to rest. Because every Albertan, rural or urban, is going to feel the effects of this budget. As we move forward and we make the changes that we need to, to ensure that we're on strong fiscal footing in the future, we've had to ask Albertans to dig deep. We're not a government that plays favorites, and we never will be. It's not our tradition as progressive conservatives, and it's not our pr tradition as the government of Alberta. We consider this budget to be a once-in-a-generation challenge and chance to put Alberta on a fiscally sustainable and a more economically diverse path. And we talked an awful lot about that last year when we talked about value added with respect to agriculture and ensuring that we had thriving communities across this province. As we're leading responsible change to direct that shift, we want to make sure that we talked to people about the choices that we made in 2013. This government was elected to keep building Alberta, to ensure that we live within our means, and to fight to open new markets for Alberta's resources. And the budget puts these priorities into action in an accountable and a transparent way, starting with a piece of legislation you're going to hear an awful lot more about once we get through budget estimates, and that's the Fiscal Management Act that we brought forward. The Act sets out clear rules, very clear rules, for future spending and mandates that we maintain separate and clear operations, capital, and savings plans so that you will be able to see what the government is doing with your money. And this marks the first time in 25 years that Alberta has focused a plan for savings that includes reinvesting in the Heritage Fund. We will expand provincial savings to more than $24 billion in the next three years because Albertans told us that it was important to save in good times and tough times, and we believe that too. Our capital plan for the next three years will invest an average of $5 billion annually in the infrastructure that we need the most. And we're also laying the groundwork for the Alberta of 20 years from now for a province of 5 million to 6 million people. And the longer that we wait, and you know this because of the decisions you have to make in your communities, the longer that we wait to start investing in the things that we need, the greater the cost in terms of dollars and quality of life. I was chatting with someone last night and they said, we're okay with you borrowing. Don't borrow for operating. And the reason it's okay to borrow is because we have kids in our community that need to be in schools today, not in 15 years. And we know that. That's why people move to this province, and we want to make sure that we're supporting families across this province. And our borrowing plan very sensibly takes advantage of how historic low interest rates and Alberta's AAA credit rating can be used to our benefit. 
but in a sensible way. With tight limits on how much we can borrow, and restrictions to keep borrowing to capital costs only, and rules to set money aside for repayment. Now, municipalities have long borrowed to finance the capital cost infrastructure when needs were too great to ignore. And the way that we're accounting to Albertans is the way that we've asked you to account to us. So we know it makes sense because it clearly sets out what our fiscal situation is and what the choices are that we're making. And we want to do the same thing. We will keep building Alberta. Quite simply, we can't afford not to. And much of the discussion that we had last night and here this morning was about exactly that. And I know yesterday morning, and I can't remember the name of the person who was speaking, but I know one of the sessions yesterday morning was about how one of the ways that we can participate in the future, even though we can't control the future, is to make deliberate decisions now that impact the future. And building infrastructure and being committed to families and communities is exactly what that's about. We can't control what happens three or four years from now, but we can make good, solid, strong choices that impact the way that the future can look. And if we do that and we think long term, we are much more likely to be successful. However, in the near term, there is no escaping that we do need to hold the line on spending. Our operating budget for the next fiscal year holds total spending increases to zero, even though population plus inflation would have put growth at 4.3%. And the public sector is sharing this pain, both the political sector and the public sector. We've lowered MLA salaries by 8%. We've frozen government managers and MLA's pay and cabinet minister's pay. We're reducing managers' ranks in the public service by 10%. And leading major agencies such as Alberta Health Services to make similar reductions to administration. And last Friday, I was so pleased to stand with Jeff Johnson and the president of the Alberta Teachers Association as we announced a long term wage freeze deal. And I want to congratulate Jeff for that agreement because that was months and months of work. Thank you. thank our teachers for understanding what we were facing and working with our government and recognizing that we had a challenging fiscal picture and truly putting kids first. Everyone will experience the effects of this budget. And I want to highlight what it means for municipalities, although in our conversations you've highlighted that for us as well. We recognize the need to balance competing demands when it comes to funding. Living within our means is a must. It's the immovable core of any vision for economic success. But at the same time, our province is still growing, and governments at every level have a duty to protect and enhance Alberta's quality of life. Budget 2013 is founded on thoughtful decisions, the decisions that are required to allow government to live within its means while continuing to deliver on our core programs. $5.2 billion has been allotted this year to continue building the infrastructure that municipalities need. And every time we've met you, Doug Griffiths and I have repeated the same thing. We will not balance the budget on the backs of municipalities. And we kept our promise. Under Budget 2013, MSI funding will remain stable at $896 million. Now I know that there were expectations that MSI funding would rise, but the circumstances just didn't leave us room to do that. Government is maintaining its commitment to municipalities by shielding the money that you count on, much of which you've already committed, from the reductions that we've had to make elsewhere. Now I also know, as we've talked about before, that municipalities rely on different government programs, and we couldn't allow any area to be immune to the revenue pressures that we're confronting. And I understand that municipalities will feel pain because some grant programs and some ministries have been reduced. We want to make sure that you can meet your priorities. And a lot of the work that we need to do now is to make sure that we're working together through the cabinet ministers that are sitting up here speaking directly with you where we find those gaps. But overall, municipalities will still get nearly $2 billion from the province in Budget 2013, which is close to what you receive currently. 
And it seems like every time I come here, I have to have a little part of my speech where I talk about addressing an issue that has caused some confusion. Despite the fact that we've been clear before, and I'm not talking about provincial sales taxes. I'm talking about issues that we talked about in the last provincial election. On the issue of whether tax dollars from the pro sports arena in Edmonton, my answer is no. When everyone in this room, from every municipality, are facing the same difficult budget decisions that we are, I can't think of a worse time to have this discussion. I do love the Oilers. Being the Premier of Alberta, I also love the Flames. <laughs> Although my actual passion is the Boston Bruins, I have to tell you. <laughs> but it is true that hockey is fundamental to our communities, both at the professional level and at the community level across the province. They are great hockey clubs and they do define Alberta. And that's not what this is about. At the end of the day, they are businesses. And they're good businesses too. They participate with our community partners, and they do tremendous work. But government needs to create a level playing field for all businesses, and then get out of the way. So we won't be providing funding for a pro sports arena. If communities who receive MSI money decide that that's the priority for their community, then it's certainly within their rights to spend the money on that. We will maintain, still, one of the country's highest rates of per capita funding for municipalities that give municipalities across the province resources to allow them to make the choices that their community thinks are most important. And even as we preserve the funding that you count on, your government will spend smarter to accomplish more. For instance, we will keep investing in affordable, affordable housing through public-private partnerships using existing funds and we'll shift more resources towards encouraging cost-efficient municipal collaboration, as Doug Griffiths has explained. And we'll also move forward on the initiatives that you've told us matter the most. We intend to introduce amendments to the Municipal Government Act this spring to provide the necessary framework for the Municipal Sustainability Strategy, which we developed in consultation with you, and which is going very well. And these amendments will offer you more and better tools to support the long-term success of smaller communities. And they'll ensure that the responsibility for deciding on a municipality's future rests with the people who live in it. There will be a public vote before any municipality can be dissolved. And you can expect another key piece of legislation this spring, one which will provide financial support for 911 call centers. Revenues from fees on landlines have been falling as more people switch to cell phones, and rural communities told us that this can't continue and we've listened. All phone users, users will contribute the cost of maintaining emergency call centers. Anyone who dials 911 frivolously will be penalized, and the bill will set the stage for the adoption of new technologies and the development of common standards. These are the changes that you requested, and we will get them passed. Alberta's rural communities are of the greatest importance to us. Doug talks about that, we all talk about it as ministers. I think you know that in terms of being MLAs that represent you. And the discussions that we have every day with you are fundamental to how we make decisions in government. And we will keep working for you because you do so much for the province. And I've heard many questions about what the budget holds for ag and rural development and I want to speak to these concerns. Contrary to what you have been told, ARD's funding has not been lowered by one-third. Payouts to producers were unusually high last year due to extreme hail last summer. And I believe that that's at the heart of the misunderstanding. We've actually been forced to scale back our allocation by 10%, or about $100 million. The largest part of that reduction is made up of changes to the agri-stability and the agri-investment programs that we deliver jointly with the federal government. As part of our successful Growing Forward 2 talks with Ottawa, the province is moving away from income assurance programs and towards strategic initiatives that are designed to improve Alberta's capacities in areas such as food safety, traceability, and livestock welfare. And I know that 
Berlin consulted extensively with producers before and after the changes were agreed, and that those changes are now starting to show up in our budget. The elimination of the six cent per liter Alberta farm fuel distribution allowance portion of the Alberta Farm Fuel Benefit Program is behind almost one third of the $100 million increase in energy funding. Benefit program recipients will still receive the nine cent per liter tax exemption on marked gas and diesel, along with the existing tax exemptions for propane and aviation fuel. We know that it can be tough out there. And we listen. And we will still help farmers control their costs through Alberta's Farm Fuel Benefit Program, which remains strong and among the best in the nation. Although it enforces the kind of tough fiscal discipline that requires us to ensure we live within our means, this budget also lays out the groundwork for a more prosperous future. And even as we push ahead with it, we're taking steps to solve the issues around revenue shortfall. Alberta's lack of market access. And that's why we have been advocating for a Canadian energy strategy. You've all heard about it, and many of you have asked what it will look like. Well, some of the details are being worked out under the leadership of the Council of the Federation with Premier's team. I'm heading a working group with uh, Premier Selinger of Manitoba and Premier Dundadale of Newfoundland, but what the strategy actually is, isn't a document. It's not a report, it's not something that we're going to put on a website and stick on their bookshelf if they care that much. What you're seeing right now is a Canadian energy strategy in action. The work that we've been able to do with Premier Wall in Saskatchewan, who's been spending time in Washington talking about our environmental record, Saskatchewan's environmental record, and extension of Keystone to the Gulf Coast, is the result of productive discussions where we all as Canadians understand that energy will be critical to our future. Premier Marois of Quebec, Premier Albert of New Brunswick, we're working very hard with them to ensure that we can see an East Coast pipeline that allows us to get our resources as Albertans to Tidewater so that we can get a fair price for those resources because they belong to Alberta. Premier Albert toured the oil stands last month and was more than tremendously enthusiastic with respect to the opportunities for cooperation. Now, we also opened an office in Ottawa on Monday so that we can speak directly to the federal government about the strategy and other issues of national concern, like Keystone XL. I'd like to spend some time talking to Thomas Mulcair about it, but I'm not sure he wants to talk to me. <laughs> you know, these are, these are challenging times for Alberta's economy and for our finances. And therefore, they are challenging times for elected officials and for Albertans themselves. And I promise you that my colleagues and I, this government, your government, will continue to do what we've been doing all along and what we promised Albertans that we would do. <coughs> to build Alberta, to live within our means, and to open new markets. turning to you for advice on how to address change. It's not just 3.8 million Albertans who are counting on us right now to make the right decisions, but the one million more who are on the way, your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren, who are either here or still to come. Those decisions, the decisions that we make today, have to start with the people that are closest to the change, meaning us, all levels of government, provincially elected officials, municipal leaders, community stakeholders, people that have come together in public service to serve Albertans. Your frank opinions, your honesty, your expertise, your advice, and sometimes your slap on the wrist, is exactly what we need to make sure that Alberta can continue to grow. So I hope that you will continue to provide all of those freely as you think about the challenges that you face this year and how we can continue to work together. I'm glad it was a successful conference. I enjoyed my time here very much. 
and I wish you well. Look forward to seeing you over the summer. I don't know if people know this yet, but I'm very excited about the fact that I've recruited a whole bunch of caucus and cabinet ministers to go camping with their families all over the province this summer. And uh, Winnebago is intense. So we'll see you on the road. And we look forward to sitting around campfires, being at your rodeos, being at your ag festivals, and talking about what's going on in your life. Thank you.